Well, I'm going to share my testimony. It's possible that you've never had a chance to hear it. Um, I'm Norm Rasmussen, the uh, director and founder of the Precious Testimonies Non-Denominational Outreach Ministry. Uh, I've shared my testimony before. It's out there on the internet some years ago. It's not the best quality, but you can hear it if you want it bad enough. I've written about it a few different ways. Um, so you can read about it, punch in Norm Rasmussen Christian Testimony. You'll find it. Uh, one or more copies of it on the internet. But I feel to uh, share my testimony from a little different perspective than what I've ever shared it before. And uh, I have a motive today. Today is December 29, uh, 2018. And it was on this day, 72 years ago, that I was born. Um, I got powerfully born again at about age 35. I'm going to get to that here uh, near the uh, ending of this testimony. God supernaturally revealed himself to me in a moment of time. And um, shortly thereafter he did that, I, I told God, now that I know you're real, Jesus Christ, I know you're the one that I'm to follow and put my trust in. Um, you didn't have to do what you did, and uh, but you did it, and uh, I'm so thankful for it. And uh, I'm going to give you the last half of my life, or 35 years, um, if you give me 70 years total to live. Well, he did that. And so now I'm on an extended period of grace, I guess, by God. So for the last two years, uh, I reached 72 years ago at this date, and now it's two years later. So I don't know how many more birthdays he's going to give me. That's up to him. Um, it's really not all that important to me. I just want to be used of him. Uh, <clears throat> while I'm down here, somehow, some way, if he wants to use me. But let's go back. I'm, I'm going to gloss over a lot of things that I've shared about at other times because there's just so much to share. And um, so, I was born and raised in a little logging community in eastern Oregon. My dad was a lumberjack, and uh, the little town of 150, 200 people that lived there. Um, if your dad didn't work at the sawmill, the lumber mill, company owned lumber mill, you didn't live in that town. And uh, so we were pretty remote. That was back in, you know, a number of years ago. And, and uh, uh, we did not have uh, many Christians in that community. If, if we did, uh, they were secret agent Christians. There were two or three or four ladies that really loved the Lord, and they kind of hung together. But beyond that, not many men uh, were uh, examples uh, to follow that I was aware of. Now, maybe there were more there. I just didn't know. But it just seemed to me there was a lot of godless people, a lot of fighting, rough, tough lumberjacks. And... Uh, so my mom and dad, they fought about um, <laughs> Christianity, it seemed like. Most of the time, at the dinner table usually, dad would start it. Um, he was convinced the Catholics were right. Well, my mom was convinced the Lutherans were right. So they fought about Lutherans and Catholics constantly, and I, neither one of them knew God. Though, I hope their souls are saved, and if so, it'll be by fire, but they didn't know much about the Bible. They didn't understand what God wanted us to understand in his letters to humanity, uh, his, his guidebook for the human race, his roadmap to, to how to please God. You can say it a number of different which ways. So we grew up basically in a godless home 
and I grew to hate God because all I heard was fighting, yellowing, arguing about who was right. Catholics are right. No, they're not. They're, they may have had some good things, but they got deceived through time, and God had to use the Lutherans, Martin Luther, to straighten the mess out. And so we heard that seemed like forever at the wrong time when you wanted to have peace at meals. And of course, they fought a lot of about a lot of things. Had a very troubled marriage, and but let's get past that. So, so I grew up like many young people. Is you know, is there a God? And if there is a God, what am I to believe about that God? Um, I want to make him happy, but I got to know who he is first before I can make him happy, right? Um, and so I heard about Christianity somewhat. Um, I responded to a vacation Bible school altar call when I was, oh, eight, nine, ten 8, 9, 10 years old, probably more like 8 or 9. Me and my buddies went to this vacation Bible school under a tent out in the middle of the dusty cow pasture just to have something to do. It was so boring up there. And, uh, you know, all the call was given, you want to stay out of hell, go to heaven, come forward, we'll pray the sinner's prayer with you, which I did, and ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And I went back to doing whatever my buddies wanted to do, and that was always usually rebellious things, as long as we didn't get caught at it. So there was no change in my life. Now, whether God honored that or not, I'll never know. All I know is, as life went on, I was always curious what other people believed about God, spiritual things. And uh, excuse me, I gotta wet my whistle. I've been battling sinus infections uh, for six weeks now and it's still lingering. Uh, anyway, so bear with me, do a little blowing here. A little drink into wet my whistle so I don't start a coughing jag. So I was extremely curious about spiritual things. Um, I was so curious about the supernatural uh, that I sent away for a couple of books, mail order books on hypnosis, how to hypnotize. Well, being, there was nothing to do in those days. Kids can't imagine how boring it would be. Most kids, but that was boring. Nothing to do, you know, in the summer months. So I sent for a book or two on how to hypnotize somebody about hypnosis. Man, I became fascinated with this stuff. And so I was looking for people to try it on. And first uh, guy that uh, let me try hypnosis on him, it worked. And it was amazing. Uh, there were three or four of us sleeping out one night, and this one kid, he said, well, you can experiment on me. And I said, okay. And man, he, it was amazing. And uh, it worked. And so that really piqued my interest. I, I began to read more anything I get my hands on regarding hypnosis. I began to hypnotize individuals who wanted to experience what it was like. Um, I did that through uh, seventh, eighth grade, uh, freshman year, sophomore year, high school. Um, numerous people I hypnotized. Um, I want to say that I never used or abused Never tried to have somebody do something that was against their will. I thank God for that. But I was fascinated with what could be done by those who came under a deeper state of hypnosis. Now, in the process of trying to understand really what was going on, uh, the books, you know, that I had read primarily from one hypnotist at that time out of California was that this is just tapping into the power of suggestion, the power of suggestion. And you're dealing with the unconscious mind. Uh, they don't understand it, but if you can get somebody to believe, they will respond. So 
Along with that, there was a book that had huge influence in my life. It was called Think and Grow Rich. It was by a Napoleon Hill. It was a big hit back in, you know, the 60s, maybe 50s, I don't know, 60s. I don't know beyond that. But this book basically, as I remember it, tried to convince you, the reader, that if you can believe something, nothing is really impossible to you. And if you refuse to believe it, then things do become impossible for you. Now, that wasn't a token statement uh, that you could do anything, but what you thought greatly influenced the outcome of the desires of your heart. And so I grew into my, I, I quit doing uh, hypnosis by the time I got into the latter part of high school and maybe I dabbled with it a few times, maybe in the early college years with a few people I did, but I never really, I don't know, got playing in sports and then it was work and then a girlfriend or girlfriends. And so I just lost interest in it really. But I was always fascinated by um, why some people could be hypnotized and why others couldn't. That really fascinated me. Why one could and the next one couldn't. And though I never really got any answers, I grew to the point where if I met a stranger, it didn't take me but a maybe a minute or two to discern they could be hypnotized or somebody else couldn't. I could discern who could and who couldn't. It was amazing if given an opportunity to try to hypnotize. I, I could tell somebody, you can't be hypnotized, so let's not even do it. Well, why don't you try it? You don't know. I just grew that confident. Now, now let's just stop here. I was still questioning what to believe about God. I was ignorant of the Bible. I, I knew a little bit about it, but it was just one of many different spiritual beliefs that people had as I got into my teens, later teens. So everybody had a different belief system about God and Christianity was just one of them. I don't know why it never really made much of an impression that Jesus Christ died for all of my sins because I didn't see myself as a sinner, so I wasn't sure I liked that part of Christianity. I, I knew I wasn't perfect, but I also knew I didn't, I didn't think I was a bad guy, okay? Now, I just want to say something right here for anybody that doesn't go any further. I grew when I got born again. I came to realize that I was operating by powers of darkness. I realized that there were demonic beings using me like a medium to influence others. It's a very subtle uh, strategy of Satan. Satan knows some things about us that God, of course, knows, but he knows something about the unconscious mind. He knows something about the spirit of a person, the soul of a person, that we don't know, and these demons are aware of it. Um, but it, it comes down to, if you can put somebody in a state of light to medium to heavy hypnosis, you can get them to believe things and use the power of suggestion, wisely administering it, to where you can have them do things months out by a pre-programmed uh, signal or by you speaking something and they will automatically respond like a robot. I did that. You know, I did that with certain people. It was amazing. I'm not going to name names or get into specifics because it's into some delicate areas, but I'll tell you what, um, mind control Satan knows all about it. And so I basically grew into my adult years pretty much 
believing. There were a couple of portions of scripture. I, I don't know where I read this, but somebody used scripture when Jesus said, to him who believes all things are possible. The positive thinking people like to grab that scripture and try to make it sound like it's legitimate in what they're trying to uh, teach or uh, persuade an individual of. And I pretty much came to this deceptive belief system that Satan tricked me into believing without my even knowing that, yeah, God can be real to you, but he may not really be real. Yeah, Christianity can work for you if you believe it can, but it doesn't necessarily mean it works for everybody. Which then brought me to the conclusion that, well, maybe Christianity is for some, but there are other ways to please God. Well, that's exactly what the New Age folks will teach you today is that, well, you know, there are many paths to God. There are many paths to heaven. And following Jesus Christ is only one way. But it may not be the way for everybody. And it may not even be the way for you. Or it might be. But expand your understanding of matters. There are many ways to please God. So in AA, if you go to AA and you get the right instructor, they'll tell you they understand the power of belief. You have to believe in a higher power. Okay? You have to believe in a higher power. I had one guy that was a former alcoholic, and he began to teach the AA classes, and he says, I told people, look, you can believe that doorknob will deliver you of alcohol addiction if you believe it. It doesn't matter what you believe will help you. You've got to believe something's going to help you. And there is so much truth to that because I've seen that through those earlier years of experimenting with hypnosis in the lives of many, many, many people. I got so good, Satan anointed me, so to speak, so well that I could get a group and I did this of 10, 15, 20 people. I'd begin to speak soft, the words I knew, and half of them would fall into a hypnotic trance. I had numbers of people hypnotized doing what I told them to do. I tried never to embarrass them or make a fool out of them, of course, but it was amazing. So this isn't just with one person. I understand that a, a stage hypnotist can uh, use this phenomenon that is on planet earth used by demonic powers because I see no value on why God would use it, why angels would use it, heavenly angels. I've come to realize he doesn't need that stuff so the only ones who would use it would be Satan. And I believe he uses that as trickery in the minds of a lot of people like he did me. Oh, God can be real if you believe he's real but it doesn't necessarily mean that's true. So you create your own reality by what you think and then subsequently believe. Okay? Well, what this did was fill my brain spirit with doubt and unbelief. If a Christian said Jesus is the only way to get to heaven, mm, no, they're deceived. I've been enlightened in that area. If Jesus is the only way to have your sins forgiven based on what he did, if you believe that, that's good for you, but it's not necessarily the thing that everybody else is supposed to believe. See, doubt had done its work. Or saying in another way, Satan's high-level weapon of doubt was in me and I was brainwashed by him and didn't know it. There were other areas where he had his weapon of unbelief 
operating in me and I didn't even know. When people talked about demons and the devil, I, I was brainwashed into believe, nah, that ain't no such thing. There, there's no such thing as demons and the devil. That's just fabricated by probably Christians, just whacked out Christians trying to put fear in people and trying to, you know, make it sound like they know more than what everybody else knows. And um, nah, 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 I couldn't believe that. So basically I was addicted 24-7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week to Satan's lying manipulation and didn't know it. Let me just share a little bit more before I get into how God broke through all of this years later. I used to tell people as I do that I, by, by age 35 when I was gonna commit suicide, I was so sick and tired of living. I was miserable. I was ready to um, see what would happen after I died. I wasn't convinced there was a heaven. I wasn't convinced there was a hell. But if there was, I guess I would find out what either place would be. And I wasn't convinced I was going to make heaven because I had lived in a lot of sin by that time. And uh, so I, uh, part of, Part of my downward spiral to where I was ready to commit suicide at age 35 was Vietnam. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of that, but, but war does things to everybody that's involved in war for any length of time, and you don't have any connection with Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. If, if you have the belief system that Satan's not real, demons are not real, or if they are real, they have no influence over the affairs of mankind because somehow God wouldn't let that happen, which is basically what I believed, as so many believe, uh, because Satan wanted me to believe that. He operates in secrecy. His greatest influence uh, in the affairs of mankind is to get people to believe he doesn't exist. <laughs> Okay, if, if in your mind, if he doesn't exist and or if he exists, he has no influence over anybody, especially you, shoot, that gives him an open door to come in and mess with you and everybody else. And they don't even know because he does it so subtly. He is sly. He is slick. He's wise and slick. And the Bible clearly tells us Jesus is the one who tells us, look, he, you know, Satan is the father of lies. He's a father of, he was a liar from the beginning. Well, he understands, Satan understands that lying is the best way to keep people from understanding spiritual truth. Okay. Truth that the father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are locked into and that will hold up for all time and eternity. Satan doesn't want us to believe that. Okay, And so he uses lies. He uses brainwashing techniques of all kinds, and we're not even aware of it. Learning about w spiritual warfare as you're a Christian, if you're uh, exposed to good teachers, you know, they'll tell you, look, we're in a battle be between good and evil. Uh, God and his holy angels, uh, Holy Spirit, Jesus, Father, then Satan and the unholy angels. And they're trying to influence uh, each and every one of us. Satan for evil, God for good. And uh, so Satan knows that he really can't have much effect on anybody until he can get them to believe lies. And if he is effective enough at getting people to believe lies, it's blinding them to the spiritual truth that the Holy Spirit wants us to understand and then believe, of course. So that is the battle. We're in a battle for our mind. 
Satan is trying to control our thoughts. The Holy Spirit would like us to let him control our thoughts, but he won't force us. Uh, he, he won't force his truth on us. Um, uh, he wants us to ask him and seek him for it and trust him for it. Well, Satan is going to do it whether you like it or not. You know, he's just going to do it from the moment you come out of mama's womb until the moment you die. He's going to try to make sure you don't get to heaven. He's going to try to make sure that you don't get all the rewards that you could possibly get by serving Jesus Christ in this life in alignment with his will for your life. Okay? Satan knows he ain't going to get forgiven and get to go back to heaven. And the demons know that. So it's pretty like, well, then uh, if we can't have it, we don't want anybody else to have it either. That's part of their motive for why they work so hard at trying to keep everybody out of heaven. Um, I'm going to be miserable for eternity. Misery loves company. I want you miserable with me. That's how they think. Sad to say, but that's the way they think. Plus, Satan lies to them and says he's going to reward them too, and they still believe the lies that Satan, you know, their king, tells them. Anyway, let's get off of that. Let's get back to the testimony. So, <clears throat> so fast forward many years. There were so many things going on in my life. Uh, in late, you know, when I was 32, 33, 34. So many things I won't get into. But the time came where uh, I had been hit with a few avalanches, so to speak. And I was just sick and tired of life miserable every which way and I was at work uh, I worked at the telephone company here in Michigan in those days and once a year we would have volunteers come in and uh, take a pint of blood from anybody who wanted to donate a pint of blood uh, the company would let you go home the rest of the day would pay and you get a glass of juice and a cookie or two you know before going home and I'd do anything to get paid to go home and not have to work didn't like my job and uh, so I always gave a pint of blood. And uh, so they took my blood pressure this particular time. And uh, her nurse's eyes got really big. And she took it again. Thought something must be wrong with her machine. Took it again. Boy, that didn't make her happy. She took it a third time. Now she's convinced the numbers are not lying to her on her blood pressure uh, testing device. And so she said, you know... <laughs> I can't believe you're alive. What do you mean? She said, these numbers, you know what these numbers mean? I said, no, I didn't know anything about numbers. She said, they're three times higher than what a living person should have. You're a dead man walking. I can't believe you haven't had a stroke by now. I can't believe your heart's still beating. Really? Yeah. You know, so she said, you better get to a cardiologist like yesterday and see what's wrong and and get some you know some medical advice because you're you're ready your heart's ready to explode any second okay so i went home with that that was on a thursday night i didn't drink my typical half three quarters fifth of booze to pass out to get to sleep like i'd been doing every other night for i don't know how long uh, excluding beer and wine we don't count that um and i thought Man, you know, I'm good. You know, I, I am so miserable with life. I'm not going to go to no cardiologist. I'm not going to report this. This volunteer nurse, they don't report it to anybody. Doesn't company doesn't know about it. It was just between the nurse and I. Why nobody's going to know? I'm just going to go ahead and let my heart explode. Massive heart attack. People will say, well, the poor guy had death by natural causes at a young age, age 35. You know. And, uh, well, okay, life goes on. Well, I had a wife. Yeah, we had a lot of marital conflict going on, had for some time. Um, a whole lot of conflict. Had two beautiful children that I wanted to be a father to and knew I wasn't a very good father at all, let alone husband to my wife. Um, and I just, I laid there and thought about it that Thursday, that evening after seeing the nurse that day, and I thought, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do nothing. I'm just going to let nature take its course. I'm not going to stop drinking. I'm not going to stop smoking my three packs of cigarettes a day. Not going to stop 
I'm just going to keep doing it, and when the heart stops, it stops. Hopefully I won't have a stroke, but uh, at least I'm not blowing my brains out or doing a drug overdose. This will be a noble way to commit suicide, I thought. Nobody will know. And uh, so <clears throat> the Holy Spirit began to work. I came to realize in that scripture portion where it says, those who diligently seek me will find me. Those who seek me with all of their heart will find me. I wasn't aware of that at that time in my life. Years later, I've learned God sometimes withholds truth from us withholds reality from the way he sees it until we get desperate enough to do something beyond what would we, we would consider to be normal, okay? I was at that place. Well, I wasn't an atheist, but I was a hardcore agnostic, uh, believing that any God that loved people and was in control over the affairs of mankind was sovereign. I had heard that. Anybody that would let a, a war like Vietnam happen where innocent people were maimed, old people killed, young people destroyed emotionally, physically, any war does that. But I was caught up in that and that just, I came to conclude, I don't know that I'd care to even meet this God. It, it surely doesn't impress me to see all of the suffering going on you know, in the affairs of mankind. And so I I grew to not care to want to warm up to whoever this God was, to be very honest. But I didn't want to go to hell if there was such a place as hell either. And of course, I was hoping that there would be something better after this life called heaven. But I didn't know, you know, if I was going to get there or not, if it existed. Okay, if heaven and hell was real. Well, now that I'm ready to take my life, the Holy Spirit began to work. I didn't know that. But he began to ask me, how can you prove that there isn't a heaven? How can you prove there isn't a hell? How can you prove that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sins isn't the only way to have them forgiven so that you would be acceptable to God the Father when you see him, which might be pretty soon? How can you prove it? You can believe that that's all a bunch of nonsense, but can you prove it? Uh, no, you can't. It gets back to what I believe, right? Yeah. It gets back to what every one of us believe. Well, I don't think you can trust that Bible. I had said that. I don't believe that thing got written by men. It's all screwed up. You can't believe anything it says anyway. Well, in time, the Holy Spirit turned that around. And he says, can you prove that God hasn't preserved that Bible so where it's accurately translated enough for you to know how to live your life and please God in alignment with truth as he sees it. Can you prove that? I couldn't prove it. God began to twist some things around. They says, okay, what, what happens if you end up in hell? Let your heart explode for eternity. Now what? You think life is miserable now? Now, how about eternity? Misery. Well, I began to squirm. I began to get really nervous. So into the night, I began to call out God, if you're real, you know what I'm going to do. I just, I, I'm miserable in life. I, 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 you know, I try to please you. I don't know who you are. I don't know why you have to be so mysterious about things. What are you, a secret? You know, why, why do you have to hide? Why do you have to make spirituality so difficult? You know, I had a million questions like that. And not like first time I ever asked them, but it's like, yeah, when you're facing death, very quickly, you'd like to get some answers pretty quick about this. And then, you know, Jesus, if you're real, if you're the one to follow, if you're the one I should put my trust in, let me know. Because I don't know. And I, I did that for hours. God, if you're real, Jesus, if you're real, please make yourself real to me. Do something to show me that you're real. It's not fabricated. It's not make-believe. It's not mind over matter. It's not positive thinking. None of that stuff. It's real, real for everybody. Well, into Thursday, Friday morning, got daybreak, time to go to work, call in sick. Well, I don't want to stay home. 
So I went into work, did my job as best I could with no sleep, exhausted. Uh, went home at night, Friday night, began the same thing, but more with intensity. I didn't drink, had no alcohol, no drugs in me. I had a sober mind. I wanted to be sure everything was working in best order as it could possibly work. So I cried out again all night, Friday night, Saturday morning, Jesus, if you're real, show yourself to me. God, if you're real, whoever you are, whatever, Father, Holy Spirit, I, you know, I don't know who you are. I don't know why you just can't call you one name. Why do I got to figure out three names? Talk about screwed up. Talk about <laughs> confusing things. You know, well, he does what he wants to do. But that was my mindset then. And so, come Saturday morning, now, I got to stop just a moment to say, I didn't know it then, but there had to be at least one demon, if not a legion of them over on this side, and one angel or maybe more from God on this one. By through the wee hours of Saturday morning, this, this, this voice would say in my being, my head, you know, there is no God. You know, why are you doing this? this you're just putting yourself through misery. Um, just... Don't worry about it, you know? Go get a drink and be happy. Live live for the moment, you know? It's all right. Don't get all whacked out of shape. Well, then this voice would just, how do you know they're in heaven? And how do you know they're in hell? And how do you know Jesus isn't the only way, you know, have your sins forgiven so that you can make sure you're going to get to heaven when you die? Okay, and maybe have some peace in your life that I've never had up to that point, to be honest. And... uh so this battle for my soul was going back and forth, and they were both trying to persuade my thinking. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And so come daybreak Saturday morning, it was just starting to break day. There was one window in the room. Uh, the curtain was cracked about yay much, and... I can see it was starting to get light out. I looked over at the clock, and I believe it was somewhere around 6 o'clock in the morning. Had one light overhead. That's all one, you know, 60-watt bulb in a ceiling up there, ceiling light. Uh, it was off. It was dark, but I knew it was starting to break day. And I lay there thinking after all this calling out to God for two nights endlessly and nothing happening and this voice saying, see, he don't care about you. Even if Jesus is real, you've sinned so many times. You've killed people in Vietnam. You tortured him for information, Norm. God don't like you. He'll never forgive you. You know that. You've hurt people. You've used people. You've abused people. So maybe it'll work for other people, but not you. You're hopeless. You're worthless. Okay. That was, and I was pretty much convinced that's probably what it was. So he wasn't going to talk to me. He wasn't going to do nothing. <clears throat> so there was not going to be one more night of that. I determined I had given God my best for two nights in a row, gave up all sleep, cried, bawled, agonized, pleaded, begged. I couldn't think of what else to do. Nothing happened. What a fool I had been, just like this demon tried to convince. Yep, what a fool. What a fool you are, Norm. So I'm laying there thinking now, well, what's it going to be like? with no children to play with, no children to have special moments with, never an opportunity to have a wife, happiness in a marriage, never an opportunity to find meaning and purpose in this life beyond existing up to that point in my life. That's about all it was, was existing. And uh, just laying there, thinking it over, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, like the room was about 30, 35, 40% brighter, instantly brighter, at least in my mind. And it's like, what's going on here? Did I die? Am I about ready to die? That's my first thought. I'm, I'm dying. I'm having a massive heart attack. I'm dying right now. And as conscious as I could think about it, I thought, well, I think the light bulb's on it in the ceiling. Well, no, you know, my eyes were open, the light bulb wasn't on, but everything in the room to me was like 30, 40% brighter. And within a second or so, it's like I knew there was a supernatural presence in that room. 
the reason I knew there was a supernatural presence in that room was like there was a huge hand pushing down on my chest, shoving me down in that bed, almost like it was going to shove me through the floor. And I could, s <laughs> but it was not painful. Immediately I felt that, but it was not painful. What it was doing was shoving unconditional love that I couldn't begin to express into me, at the same time sucking out pain and agony out of me. And I could, it's like, this bedroom's going to explode. There's so much love in it. It's like I could just see or imagine the roof going up, the walls going out, the floor going down, because there was such a presence of God in that room of love. It was unconditional love. I had never experienced love like that ever. And I didn't know if I'm living or dying or what. All I know is I have no control of what's going on. It's fully controlling me. Now, Jesus wasn't standing. I didn't see a being in the room, though the light stayed, like I say, of equal intensity. And I'm feeling all this unbelievable love caught in the middle of it, not knowing what's going on other than I'm loving what's happening. And a voice speaks to me very clearly. Very clearly, I hear this voice. And this voice says some things to me that I don't have liberty from God to share publicly. From time to time, I share it with individuals that I feel God wants me to, but publicly, I don't have the liberty from God to share it. But he told me some things I needed to do to have a life change, to get right with him, and uh, okay. And when he said just a few short words of what I needed to do, it all instantly went back to the way it was. The room was dark, like before. Uh, I was back to normal. <laughs> the presence was gone, and I thought, what just happened? I didn't die. I'm assuming I was going to die. I, I didn't die. I looked over, still just starting to break daybreak. I looked at the clock. A minute or two had gone by. This had happened in a few split seconds, I guess. I lost all track of time while it was going on, but all I know is... The agony and pain that I had had up to that point and for a life, it was all gone. And I had nothing but peace. I had a peace and I had a feeling of being loved by God, accepted by God, that I had never known before. And so I said, well, I just found out God's real. And I know that was Jesus Christ. It was the spirit of Jesus Christ that showed up in my room. How did I know that? I don't know. It just got supernaturally deposited in my being. I knew it was Jesus who had showed up. And, and because of that, I got through the covers off, set up on the side of the bed, still dark. I said, Jesus, now I know you're real. And I know you didn't have to do what you just did. But because you did, I now owe you everything. And if you give me 35 more years, I'll try to serve and please you the rest of my life. I don't know why I said 70 years, but I did. It was like, it was the right thing to say. And so that began my born again experience. And I won't get into in this setting how God took me to a local church and you know, I, I taught the Word of God, made some Christian friends who knew a lot about God and, you know, the Bible. And so God had things in place as time went on and and uh, ended up getting out of a very troubled marriage. And God gave me a second chance at marriage in a few years with the wife I now have, Kathleen. And so we could grow together and be a team doing ministry and enjoying each other and life, you know, as we grow older. So that is how God broke through the prison that I had put myself in that Satan had constructed for me. I had two feet in hell and didn't know it. I was headed for an eternity separated from God and didn't know it. And God showed up 
for whatever reason, I guess he was able to look at me and say, you know what, he's pretty crusty, but I think he's a good investment for the kingdom of God. Let's do a miracle in his life. And he did. And though I'm about as tough as a nut to crack, I'm sure God many times has questioned his wisdom in bailing me out. Um, there is forgiveness. Thank God. There's mercy and grace. There is forgiveness. And so it has been a pleasure and an opportunity to be given 37 years now to try to be used of him to help others come to realize there is a God, God's real, Jesus Christ is real, the Bible is trustworthy, and Jesus Christ truly was God. Took me a while to get that revelation. He was always God before he came to this earth. He came to earth as a man because it was the only way God could bridge the human race in good standing with God. It was the only way. So Jesus came down, form of a man, lived this life for 33 years, was tempted to sin like everybody, never sinned once. That was the one and only acceptable sacrifice God the Father determined would pay for the sins of every person, whoever has lived or ever will love, living right now. He paid the penalty for all of our sins. So he gave us free pardon. We have to reach out, grab it, be thankful for it, show our appreciation, and let him use our lives however he wants to use them from there. And uh, so um, God has said to much to those who much have been given, much is required. And that's a part of, uh, there's a sense of knowing God did not have to do what he did. Many people have heard my testimony over the years and said, wow, I wish I'd have had a supernatural experience like that. My wife has never had a supernatural experience like that. She's been a Christian longer than I have. And I understand multitudes would, wow, I'd love to have some sort of supernatural experience like that. No, you don't. Jesus said to Thomas, the doubting uh, apostle, the disciple, all the rest of them saw Jesus after he'd resurrected, but Thomas wasn't there. So they said, hey, we saw Jesus. You know, he really resurrected like he said he was going to. A glorified body, Thomas says, hey, I don't be... Until I see it, I ain't going to believe it. You know, that ain't good enough for me. And besides that, I don't know why he showed up when I wasn't there. I don't like how that came down. I'm sure he thought that. But I didn't feel very good about that at all. But anyway, Jesus ends up manifesting himself again. Says, Thomas, touch, touch where they cut me. Touch the nail holes in my hand. See the holes in my ankles where they nailed me to the cross. I'm him. I'm resurrected. Glorified form. And so Jesus then is recorded as saying, uh, you know, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. And that's where most Christians have to operate in, in faith, trusting and believing as best they can. It's the real deal. And it will be rewarded for eternity for those who continue to place their trust in Jesus Christ as God, as the one who will reward them for their faithfulness and trusting and believing. Though there may be many times of doubt, unbelief, and frustration and anger like there is in so many people, yet God is looking for people who do want to serve him, but in alignment with truth, spiritual truth. The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is the only source of truth that God wants people living their lives by. So, I think it's time to close it down. If you got this far, thanks for listening to my share, and I pray that um, somehow, some way, maybe God will use this to influence your life, somebody else's. Let's, let's pray for a prayer here before we, you know, we close this out. Father, I just ask in Jesus' name that if anybody who is struggling with believing you're real, struggling with Jesus, do I really follow you or don't I? Um, imprisoned in doubt and unbelief and confusion like I was, I pray, Father, you'd set them free. Put something in their heart not to quit, not to give up, but press in, press in, press in. Have them dig deeper if needed to, to have an experience of their own if they need one, or just 
remove the cloud of lies and doubt and confusion and unbelief. Just supernaturally remove it instantly or in time, however you decree is best for these individuals, that they might clearly see spiritual truth. Um, Jesus is truth personified. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He reveals all truth to us. God, you're the one that has a handle on truth. Satan tries to twist it and uh, make truth uh, something that it is not and hoping that the people who believe uh, falsehood, lies, um, don't grasp that they've been lied to in believing his lies. Father, I pray that you'd bear much fruit for your glory through this video and the other things that you've enabled us to do in ministry. And uh, Father, I just thank you for giving me 72 years down here. If you want to give me more years, I pray they're more productive than anything uh, that we've been able to do to help uh, people come into the kingdom of God uh, and understanding salvation, the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the most important thing that we can reach out and grab a hold of in this lifetime. Uh, thank you, Father, for uh, having mercy upon me. I consider myself to be the least most deserving, and I owe you. I owe you my life. And thank you, Lord, for deciding that there was something of some value uh, that you decided, yep, I'm going to go ahead and use him. So thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name.